The ethanol industry takes its responsibility to public safety very seriously. We've got a great public safety record, but as the industry grows, we want to make sure that first responders have the information they need to address any issues that may arise as ethanol is shipped across this country. Ethanol is a fuel derived from grains such as corn, wheat, and switchgrass. It provides our nation with a renewable source of energy that is used today in vehicles coast to coast. During 2006, the domestic ethanol industry produced approximately 6 billion gallons of ethanol and was blended into 46% of our gasoline supply nationwide. There are projections that ethanol could be blended in almost every gallon of gasoline sold in the U.S. by 2010. With the current rapid growth of the ethanol industry, firefighters, hazardous material specialists, and other emergency response experts have become increasingly concerned about the lack of consensus with regard to how to best fight a fire involving a large volume of an ethanol blended fuel. In the following minutes, you will see how frontline responders can maximize their chances for success and minimize their risk with the necessary knowledge and tools for how to combat industrial polar solvent fires. To better prepare to respond to an ethanol fuel emergency, it is important to understand the process by which it comes to market. Ethanol's journey usually starts in our nation's heartland, where the grains from which it is derived are grown. Here the grain is harvested and delivered to an ethanol production facility where it will be processed into ethanol. At this point, the alcohol is denatured with up to 5% of a hydrocarbon like natural gas liquids or gasoline. This denaturing process makes ethanol unsuitable for human consumption. The ethanol, now referred to as E95, is then shipped to a distribution terminal by unpressurized rail car, tank truck, or barge. At the terminal, the fuel will be pumped into a storage tank. Final blending with gasoline into E10, 10% ethanol, or E85, 85% ethanol, occurs at the loading rack where tank trucks are loaded for final distribution to the local gasoline station. Okay, this is the ethanol unloading station at this facility. It's located under their truck loading rack. The tanker with the ethanol pulls into this bay and hooks up this line and can also hook up a second line with that hose to his tanker. And then these pumps will pump the ethanol out off the truck and out into the tank in the tank field. Here at the terminal, the ethanol is blended into gasoline for use in private and commercial vehicles. At this facility, E95 was most commonly blended with gasoline to make E10, or a mixture of 90% gasoline containing 10% ethanol. This will also be referred to as gasohol. Once a tanker is filled with blended fuel, it may depart for almost any destination within the region. With terminals located throughout the U.S., truckloads of ethanol blended fuels are likely to be found across the land. Members of the bulk liquid terminal industry, many of whom we represent, are dedicated to conducting their operations safely and to preventing emergency situations before they can occur. Our industry holds a focus on response capability to the eventuality of an emergency, including tank fires. In 2006, general industry response preparedness to ethanol was being evaluated, prompted by the increasing volume of this fuel being handled here in the United States. Diverging opinions surfaced among the leading authorities on how to carry out an effective response to a large ethanol fire emergency, particularly the type of foam which is able to extinguish a large-scale polar solvent fire. This uncertainty led to the formation of the Ethanol Emergency Response Coalition and this foam study. To find the answers that emergency responders and the industry need, a specialized test facility was required to carry out the necessary analysis. The Tyco Corporation provided their experienced chemists and scientists and the use of their Ansel Fire Technology Center in Marinette, Wisconsin, to test the varying foams available and extinguishment methods using established test standards and methodology. What makes us unique among, among others is the Fire Technology Center where we are performing these tests, not just in our world-class classroom uh, facilities, but our ability to um, run fires of all types of different fuels and firefighting agents. Uh, we have the ability to uh, set indoor and outdoor fires up to 
approximately 3,500 square foot in area and test all sorts of different fire extinguishing technologies and agents on a variety of fuels. We were able to conduct large-scale fire tests, the UL versions of fire tests, up to as much as 100 square feet in our fire test center. Our fire test house is basically 75 by 65 by 55 feet in, in height, width, and uh, length which gives us essentially a very large chimney in which to conduct fire tests. And in there, we are able to, to burn uh, any number of fuels that uh, might need to be tested. And what we've been able to do this week is conduct fire tests using E95 or denatured alcohol and gasohol, 10% or alcohol and gasoline. Okay, I believe it's very important that everyone understand that the testing is being done on foams is what's referred to blind testing. The container is a white pail. It's only marked with A, B, C, D, and E, or F. And the container then is marked 3% or 4% or 6%, whatever percent the foam is to be used at. The testing was conducted over a two-week period starting in February 2007, strictly following the Underwriters Laboratory 162 test methodology. The first step in the testing process is premixing foam solutions to their specified concentrations in water. The general types or families of foams tested included alcohol resistant aqueous film forming ARA triple F foam, a traditional aqueous film forming A triple F foam, a class A foam intended for fire involving ordinary combustible or class A materials, an emulsifier, a conventional fluoroprotein foam and an alcohol-resistant film forming fluoroprotein AR triple FP foam. There were three foam application scenarios used for the UL-162 tests, type 2, type 3, and sprinkler application. Every test consumes 55 gallons of fuel, and for this study, both E95 and E10 were tested. The fuel must be a minimum of 50 degrees Fahrenheit before ignition. Once the fuel is ignited, a 60-second pre-burn period begins. The pre-burn allows the volume of the fuel to heat up or become fully involved. In a Type 2 application, the nozzle directs the foam concentrate stream against a vertical surface or wall of the fire pan opposite the nozzle, creating a more gentle application on the surface of the burning fuel. In a Type 3 application, the foam stream is directed onto the burning fuel surface, plunging and submerging into the fuel when applied. The sprinkler application, which is most common at industrial truck loading racks, was tested differently. With only a 15 second pre-burn, the sprinkler system is activated, providing another approach to a gentle application. In each of the three application types, if the foam was able to extinguish the fire, it was put through a burn back test. According to UL standards, the last corner of the pan to stop burning is to be used for the burn back test, as this is the most likely place to see failure. The technician scoops out a portion of the foam blanket and lights it on fire. This test evaluates the foam's resistance to fire. After the UL designated waiting period of five minutes, the foam blanket is inspected. If it has deteriorated by 20% since reignition, the foam fails the burn back portion of the test. If the foam does not lose 20% of its coverage within the time limit, it passes. The chemical makeup of all of the fuel used for these tests was verified in the laboratory. There were 43 individual tests conducted on both denatured ethanol, or E95, and E10 gasohol. With a type 2 or type 3 application, there was a one minute pre-burn before foam application would begin. With the sprinkler test, the foam application started within 15 seconds. Using the Type 2 application, only one of the six foams was able to extinguish and pass the UL-162 burn back test for a denatured ethanol fire, alcohol-resistant ARAFFF. Alcohol-resistant ARFFP foam extinguished the E95 at an increased application rate, but did not pass the burn back test. None of the foams without an alcohol-resistant polymer in the AR prefix were successful extinguishing a denatured alcohol fire in accord with the UL-162 test method. None of the foams extinguished an E95 fire with a Type 3 application, and only the ARAFFF was capable of passing a sprinkler application. Similarly, only the ARAFFF was considered successful in combating the gasohol fires. Both the ARAFFF and the conventional AFFF extinguished a gasohol fire with a Type 3 application at the UL specified application rate. 
but only the ARAFFF could pass the burn back portion of the test, and this required an increased application rate, technically failing the UL test, but still achieving the desired results. Two foams were able to pass the UL-162 sprinkler testing on gas alcohol, ARAFFF, and conventional fluoroprotein foam. The alcohol-resistant film-forming fluoroprotein foam failed the sprinkler test on a gas alcohol fire, as did the conventional AFFF, the Class A foam, and the emulsifier. Six foam families were tested. Regardless of the manufacturer or brand, chemically, these tests verify that if the foam is water-soluble and does not contain an alcohol-resistant polymer, it will not effectively put out a large ethanol fire. To understand the science behind our results, let's visit Ansel's laboratories. Okay, folks, what we'd like to do is give you a tabletop demonstration of why some of the foams that we've been testing during this program work and others don't. Basically, the problem behind these foams when they encounter a polar solvent fuel or a water miscible fuel like ethyl alcohol is that ethyl alcohol and water readily mix together. And so the problem is foam bubbles, if you look at a bubble wall, is comprised mostly of water. If you think about the mixture that we make of foam, we have approximately a uh, 97 parts water to 3 parts foam. That's what a 3% concentrate would be. So, what we're going to do is make up a premix by uh, mixing up uh, 97 milliliters of water with 3 milliliters of each of the concentrates, with the one exception of the Class A foam concentrate, where the nominal proportioning uh, mixture is a maximum of 1%. The laboratory testing began with foam A, an ARAFFF. This foam has an alcohol resistant polymer built into the solution, allowing it to rest on the fuel surface. This thin layer provides a protective coating between the foam and the fuel, trapping the flammable vapors below the foam surface. In the next beaker is a traditional straight AFFF. Because this foam offers no resistance to alcohol, it is absorbed slowly into the alcohol, leaving no foam blanket. Third to be tested was a Class A foam, which, like the previous foam, had no polymer to protect the foam blanket from the fuel below. The fourth test is of an emulsifier, which is not designed to generate a foam blanket. Fluoroprotein foam in the fifth test failed for the same reason as the others and is readily absorbed into the fuel. Finally, an AR Triple FP was tested. This, like foam A, also has a polymer to protect the foam blanket from the fuel surface reducing the effects of dehydration. What was seen in this test was that only the foams with an AR prefix were able to make a foam blanket on ethanol. So what about the emulsifier? Lab tests were continued to visualize how emulsification was supposed to work. Emulsifiers have been tested on hydrocarbon fuels with positive results. The emulsifying agent is soluble in water and this solution can encapsulate a hydrocarbon fuel. When working with a fuel like ethanol, which is itself soluble with both water and the emulsifier, encapsulation of the polar solvent never occurs because it is already dissolved in the fuel. Therefore, an emulsion is not able to form. Some emergency responders have proposed dilution as a possible way of managing polar solvent fires. While this may be theoretically possible at high dilution rates, it appears not to be practical. This lab test reveals that ethanol diluted to 500% will still burn steadily. Clearly, these results do not support combating a polar solvent tank fire by flooding with water. With test results and laboratory demonstrations in hand, the Ethanol Emergency Response Coalition wanted to talk to someone with abundant experience combating large-scale industrial fire emergencies. Dwight Williams of Williams Fire and Hazard Control has extinguished hundreds of major fires all around the globe and is well respected as an industry leader. My name's Dwight Williams. I've been in the firefighting business since uh, 1969. Our company's fought fires all over the world, and uh, both with hydrocarbon fires as well as uh, uh, polar solvent fires. Polar solvent fires in a, in a terminal or pipeline operation where you got storage tanks and, and headers and manifolds, arteries running in and out. Uh, those fires will be fires in depth, and they'll be pressure fires. And it's not just all about the right foam. You have to have the right dry chemical as well. You have to have the right tools to engage these fires. And if you don't put the pressure fires out, the tank fires will be very difficult to be extinguished, if not impossible. 
An ethanol fire or polar solvent fires are fought differently. You don't just land on the liquid from afar. You have to uh, you have to make a more gentler application, or you have to hit the inner wall of the tank. Uh, we've got methodologies that we use on, on impacting the inner walls. If you have a tank that is full of product and you have no system on it to extinguish it and the roof is blown off, then you must get some outage in a tank. You cannot just lay your foam right down on top of it and expect for any real degree of success. With evidence and knowledge of which foam products work and those that don't, as well as greater understanding of the techniques that promote effective application, the response community and those who handle ethanol blended fuels must prepare for risks in the distribution of both E95 ethanol and E10 gasohol. Well, Fairfax City, which is located in the Washington, D.C. area, we have a tank farm, a terminal in our uh, first due area. Our tank farm experiences about four four to five hundred tank trucks full of ethanol blended fuel deliveries every day, plus additional gasoline shipments. We also have about 40 to 50 tank truck loads full of ethanol, pure ethanol, that come into the tank farm that are loaded into bulk storage tanks to be blended with gasoline at the loading rack or at other points within the loading process. That means that our department, as well as our jurisdictional neighbors need to be ready to not only deal with a ethanol blended fuel uh, of E10, but they also need to be ready to deal with an incident e either in transportation or in a bulk scenario involving pure ethanol. Risk assessment at the community level is critical for effective hazardous materials response. Fire departments need to be prepared to deal with uh, emergencies that might involve ethanol blended fuels, and the best way to do that is to understand what materials, what hazards are being stored in those communities so they can have the proper equipment, the proper materials, the proper extinguishing agents and foams, and develop the proper training for their personnel to be able to deal with those emergencies should they occur. As we hope you have seen from this program, the traditional methods of dealing with a gasoline emergency are probably not going to work with ethanol blended fuels or ethanol. It's important that you understand the uh, materials and the hazards that are in your community. It's important that you understand what the risks are uh, involving ethanol blended fuels and ethanol and be able to prepare your department, have the right equipment, have the right foam concentrates, have the right training to deal with those emergencies should they recur.